the trajectory uh, from academia into the church and back again was a little more complicated than that. Um, I was a doctoral student in history at Harvard and at about the point when I had the first draft of my dissertation on Lutheran hymns and their role in the Reformation completed, I decided to um, get a degree in theology as well, a master's degree. Uh, so I actually finished the dissertation while I was doing work at a Lutheran seminary for a first degree in theology and it was part of that training that involved a year-long sort of full-time placement as vicar of a Lutheran congregation in Valparaiso, Indiana. Uh, so I actually completed the dissertation and submitted it while I was in that position. Um, so things interlocked uh, a little more than being in sequence. Uh, so it was very interesting to be part of the life of a, a contemporary religious community in the tradition that I had been writing about, um, to participate, of course, in the, the musical life of a contemporary congregation for whom uh, many of the texts and the melodies that I had been studying were still part of the current um, practice of worship. And I get maybe especially to see how important those things are, still are, to people in the realm of pastoral care. Um, I remember doing hospital visits, uh, for instance, uh, in the role of a, a vicar, and uh, finding that very often for people, it was the hymns that they had learned as children that were still very present in their memory, sometimes even when other things were slipping away. Uh, but it was the hymns that they remembered and wanted to hear again or to, to sing together as they were at the end of life. Um, so it was very different from an academic study of how these things worked in the 16th century, but it was, it was very affecting um, and very important for me to see how those things still fit function in a modern community. So the study of, of hymns has, <clears throat> in the last centuries, been really its own discipline. Um, hymnography as a sub-discipline of musicology. Uh, so there's been a great deal of scholarship <clears throat> both in, in Europe and more recently in the United States by musicologists looking at, at hymns and their, their melodies, um, their liturgical use in particular. But I came at the subject uh, really from a background in social history and intellectual history. Um, and I was looking at different ways, maybe a new way of looking at the Reformation and its significance, the, the ways in which ideas had been transmitted to a, a popular audience. Um, so the role of, of music and of texts that went with music at that nexus um, between sort of public liturgical practice, uh, by musical professionals in early modern Europe and the use of those same melodies and texts at a popular level uh, by people who were singing them in public as well as in private. Um, that seemed like a very rich nexus for looking at uh, the ways in which ideas uh, but also um, cultural aspects were communicated and transformed as part of the religious upheavals in 16th century Europe. Um, so trying to fit those pieces together, the work that had been done in musicology with work on the social history of the, the Reformation and the history of Reformation theology. Well, the question, what is music, uh, in part has to do with the relationship between um, music as such and texts that are associated with it. And um, I've been very interested in that intersection. Um, I think it was a challenge to take the music seriously, as seriously as the, the text. And of course, the texts are easier for someone with a historical or literary training to look at. Um, it's also challenging to look back at uh, pre-modern music because one of the most important things in our experience of music is often our emotional reaction. Um, and it's problematic to project our own reaction to early modern music, our own affective reaction, back onto 16th century people. So part of the challenge is finding 16th century sources that let us check our own reactions with those of 16th century listeners. There's a gap between the way that 16th century listeners would have heard these sounds and the way that we tend, out of our own musical background, to 
approach them. So it was a good challenge to find 16th century sources that speak about what particular pieces of music, particular forms of music, meant affectively for early modern listeners. Well, my own background in music is chiefly as a, an amateur musician. Um, I've worked a little bit as a, a church organist uh, in a much earlier phase of, of my life at, at a very rudimentary level. Um, but I think finding the, the textual sources um, that shed light on early modern listeners' reactions is something that makes sense to me as a social historian and also helpful for musicologists. So one of the, the fascinating things about religious music in the 16th century, particularly the, the Protestant hymns that I've looked at that begin to sort of flood Germany and uh, other places in Europe from the 1520s onward, is that they get used in community contexts, of course, in, in public worship where they're sung together by, by groups, uh, but also in private contexts, um, either one person on their own and their own devotion, or especially interesting for me is their use in the context of the household. Right? And so looking at the way that texts and music travel back and forth among these different contexts and seeing whether, for instance, the things that are being sung publicly are in fact also what people seem to be choosing to sing privately uh, in contexts which they have more control over uh, became for me a way of looking at just how much traction, so to speak, the, the Reformation had acquired over the course of the 16th century as a, a popular movement, not just something that was being publicly managed by theologians and princes who were supporting them, but something that people actually chose to take into their own private devotion. The Reformation begins as a university movement. Right? Martin Luther is a professor of theology at a university. The 95 Theses are a set of propositions in Latin that are intended for academic debate. Right? When he posts them on the church door in Wittenberg, that's the bulletin board where professors go to post the theses that they're going to defend in public. Right? So the Reformation at that level, and Luther's career for the rest of his life as a university professor, belongs to a pretty ethereal realm of intellectual theological discussions among professors. But of course what's interesting about the Reformation from the standpoint of social history is that it doesn't remain there. Right? Um, Andrew Pedigree, the Reformation historian, has uh, recently shown just how um, clever Luther was in using the printing press to create his own brand, as Pedigree calls it. Um, not just using the printing press, but in some ways really saving the printing press or printing as an industry. And one of the key parts in that um, is his publication of music and hymns. And we think about, for example, Luther's treatises or tracts that are poured out from the presses in Wittenberg in the 1520s or his German translation of the Bible, which appears in 1522 as being a sort of huge presence in the 16th century press, and, and they, they were. Uh, Luther's German Bible is a, a bestseller by any standard. But the number of hymnal printings was really an order of magnitude greater than the total number of New Testament printings, uh, much less printings of the whole Bible. So one of the things that that tells us is that music really was at the center of the Reformation as it was received. I think people were more likely to have a hymnal in their homes than they were a Bible, as popular and significant as the, the Bible was. So in looking at hymns, I think the discovery of just how significant they were in the 16th century press, that was a, a surprise for me. I had expected them to, to be there, but I, I would not have expected at the outset that there would be more hymnals than New Testaments published in the 16th century. 
Well, one of my current projects is sort of building on trying to look at this intersection between sort of ideas and their uh, popular dissemination. I'm looking at uh, 16th century wedding sermons. So the idea of preaching a sermon actually at the occasion of the wedding when two people are exchanging their vows publicly um, is actually something that Lutherans invent uh, by the end of the 1520s. It had not been part of the established medieval practice. So it's a, a new genre and it's one which to some extent like the hymns uh, is there at the nexus between new ideas about uh, gender, uh, about the, the household, um, about emotion, um, what constitutes a, a marriage. But this is the way in which people actually heard these new models being presented in the context of a, a parish. Right? So looking at these, uh, these sermons at least is an interesting complement to looking at 16th century gender relations and, and marriage through other lenses, um, through normative legal texts or through the records of, of courts that are hearing um, cases in which marriages are in, in conflict or um, disintegrating. Not surprisingly, uh, the wedding sermons have a more positive image of marriage, um, but I guess what has surprised me is that they also have a, a more flexible one. Right? That even though 16th century wedding liturgies like to dwell on prescriptive texts that list um, duties of husbands and wives and children toward one another, preachers almost never give a sermon about that kind of text. What they like to preach on are stories. Right? So stories about Adam and Eve, of course, but uh, stories about um, Isaac and Rebecca, and the patriarchs and matriarchs, uh, King David and his wives. Um, those narratives give rise to sermons that have a lot more flexibility in the way that they depict gender relations than these other normative texts uh, might lead us to believe. So again, looking at these texts that are at the intersection of, sort of normative theological ideas and their popular presentation um, has been very interesting and I'm looking forward to, uh, to finishing that work and publishing more on it. <laughs>